Thank you. You may be seated. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I hope you mean that when you sing it. Remember, many of these hymns you're making promises to God. And whenever you sing a hymn of consecration, he expects you to keep your word. Even though it is sung, it is still the words that are coming out of your mouth. And Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That day is coming, and I trust that each one of us will be able to give a good account. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 13. Today we are looking at part three. I hope we can finish this segment of messages, the way of the wilderness and war, out of these few verses here. We have some very exciting things coming up in just a little bit in the book of Exodus. And uh, so this is preparation for some of the very important things. If you don't have this as a foundation, you will not understand some of the things that happen later in the book of Exodus and then into the book of Numbers. And so um, Exodus chapter 13, we're beginning in verse 17. Now I'll give you a quick summary of what we've learned so far. The cleansing work of the Spirit of God in progressive sanctification is clearly illustrated in the wilderness wanderings of Israel and the subsequent conquest of Canaan. That is sort of the theme of the last six messages. We looked three messages at the way of the wilderness. Now this is our third message on the way of the wilderness and war. So the first thing that we learned was that this illustrates for us, and that's the way in which it is referred to in the New Testament, as an illustration of that middle set of doctrines dealing with sanctification. That is progressive sanctification, practical sanctification, experiential sanctification. What we're going through right now as we live our lives going through this world, which is like a wilderness. We've already studied positional sanctification. That's our position in Christ, where God chose us as his people now in the New Testament, as he chose Israel in the Old Testament. That is that choice where they do not lose that position and love of their Heavenly Father. That is the same type of thing that we experience today. That illustrates positional sanctification. What we're studying now is progressive or practical sanctification. How does it work out in time and space as we live in this very evil world, this wilderness? And part of that is learning to walk by faith. Part of that is learning to do spiritual warfare. And then the final one, which I hope to get to at the end of the message today, is ultimate sanctification. When once, finally, and to all of our great delight, we will stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, either through death or at the moment of the rapture when he calls us up to meet him in the clouds, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. So, what we've learned. Step one, the cleansing work of the Spirit of God and progressive sanctification is illustrated in the wilderness wanderings. They portray sanctification that relates to learning to trust God, to learning that he never leaves us, that he never forsakes us. We have to trust him rather than our own hoarded resources. Crossing the Jordan into the promised land, I mentioned this last week, portrays the second level of progressive sanctification. You know, they wandered for 40 years, and finally God let them cross the Jordan River, and he performed a miracle there too, just like he parted the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan River at flood stage so that all the armies of Israel could march across on dry ground, just like they had done when they crossed the Red Sea 40 years earlier. They're finally getting around to doing what God wanted them to do, going into the land. But crossing the Jordan, the promised land, portrays the second level of progressive sanctification, which is spiritual warfare. Crossing Jordan into the promised land is not going to heaven. I know there are a lot of songs about that, like, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Well, people, when you sing that, they're thinking about heaven. If you go through the chorus, if you go through the rest of the verses, but that's not the theology that's taught in Scripture. It's a nice song. <laughs> Enjoy the song. But Canaan is not heaven because they had to fight giants in Canaan. 
And when we get to heaven, we will not have to fight giants. That's still part of the second half of progressive sanctification. Most of the Jews never got to that second level of progressive sanctification. At the first level of training and testing, they failed and God killed them. Ten times they rebelled, God killed them. You know, I wonder how many in the church, if we use that as an illustration, and it is given two or three times in the New Testament, extended passages dealing with this issue, if we use that as an illustration of the church today, how many ever really make it to that second level of doing spiritual warfare instead of always going down in spiritual defeat? Because they've never learned to walk by faith. They've never learned that first half, which is learning to trust God and obey his word, even if it doesn't look like it's rational. Oh, yeah, we're in spiritual warfare, and we all know that. But the problem is we never win. When Israel crossed the Jordan, they defeated enemies. They took the land. They didn't get defeated every time like they did at the Battle of Ai because they had disappeared or disobeyed. One man, Achan, took some stuff that God told him not to take and he hid it under the, the rug in his tent. And you know what they did to him? They stoned him to death. And from then on, they had victory. How much of the church today never, ever goes on to spiritual victory? We'll be talking about that later. We need to remember that God forgives, but God still brings chastening and temporal judgment as a consequence for sin. Some of us never win, and so we are always under chastening and wonder why God isn't there answering our prayers. We saw that Paul listed five specific sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that are warning examples for us. Verse 6 says, now these things were our examples. Number one, not to lust after evil things. Number two, neither be idolaters. Number three, neither commit fornication, sexual immorality. Number four, uh, don't tempt Christ as some of them tempted. Number uh, five, neither murmur as some of them murmured. And then he says it again in verse 11, nigh all these things happen unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. What we're studying in Exodus is for today. It's not just for the people back then. It's not just so we can learn some kind of interesting Bible history. It's because it tells you how God deals with his own people when they sin. Not how he deals with the world. We're talking about God's people. Israel in the Old Testament was God's people. The church in the New Testament is God's people. How does God deal with his people? These are our examples. Learn the lessons because God will apply the lessons. Did you know that every time you listen to me preach... Now, I know some of you will say, man, I'm never going to come back there again. But every time you listen to me preach, God holds you accountable for what you've heard. Did you get that? Every time you hear me preach, God holds you accountable for what you've heard. And you've heard me say some things many times because I don't see change. Politicians are always talking about change, and it's always change for the worse. God wants change, too. Metamorphosis is the word that is used, the metamorphosis of your mind in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. God wants change. He wants change for holiness. He wants change for obedience. He wants change for faith, learning to trust him when it seems to be irrational in terms of the world's concept of reason. You are held accountable for what you hear. Be careful. Someday God will say, did you obey what you heard from my word? Not because I said it, but because it's in the word of God. Between one half and two thirds of every sermon is me reading scripture text and then making brief application. But it's God's word that does not return unto him void. It is God's word that will prosper in the thing whereto he sent it. Ah, oh, dear people, these things were written for our examples. Those are the five sins. They were summarized by one specific category of sin that we saw over in Hebrews chapter 3, which is the failure of faith. The failure of faith. Your fathers tempted me and proved me. It was in the provocation, 40 years. They always err. They have not known my ways. 
because they had an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's Hebrews chapter 3. Harden not your hearts is in the provocation. It's for us. Don't do the same thing that they did. Hebrews 13, 15. For someone they had heard did provoke. What happened to those who sinned? Their carcasses fell into the wilderness. Verse 17. Why didn't they ever get to enter into the promised land and have rest? He swore that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. When you do not obey the word of God, it proves you do not believe the word of God because genuine faith always results in obedience and works of righteousness. We saw that was a clear illustration of the point of no return principle. Only two guys made it, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them didn't. They had reached the point of no return. Another illustration of the point of no return that we looked at was Esau over in Hebrews chapter 12, 14 through 17. He thought he could get away with it just one more time of disbelieving God, disobeying God, just one more time. And suddenly he was over the cliff and it was too late and he couldn't go back, even though he tried to repent. Even though he sought his blessing back with tears, he couldn't get it back. That brought us to a common sin in the church, the sin of presumption. Israel presumed that God would back down to his threat that they would never have victory and would die in the wilderness. It's an illustration for us. Remember, if a Christian pushes God too far, the same thing happens to the Christian. He never gets victory and he dies in the wilderness. That was Numbers chapter 14, verses 41 and following. So let me give a quick recap. We covered an awful lot of material, five weeks worth just there in those few minutes. The first half of progressive sanctification is learning to walk by faith through the wilderness, learning to trust God implicitly, explicitly, and totally with full obedience, which is the proof of faith. That second half of progressive sanctification is spiritual warfare. In the introduction to spiritual warfare last week, we looked at the children, the children who came out of Egypt and who grew up in the wilderness. Now, some of you were young people and children when this church went through its first 40 years. You grew up in the walk of the wilderness. You've made it now into this second generation, which is the generation that's supposed to be spiritual warfare. Those are children in the wilderness. That was a generation that was spared from dying in the wilderness wanderings. They also got their shot at it, just like you and I have. They had additional things that they illustrate for us. They illustrate spiritual warfare when they got to the promised land. We saw that in scripture, a generation is 40 years and we're past our 75th anniversary in this church, haven't quite reached 80 yet. The question will be at the end of that 40 years, will we have failed our tests as a church? Like that generation failed in the wilderness and the second generation failed in their conquest of the land. Because now it brings us to what happened after that. You remember what happened after that? After that second generation? <clears throat> we have all the Moses and all the elders that outlived him and Joshua and all the elders that outlived him. Israel sort of obeyed during their rule, but when they died, we enter the period of the judges and we suddenly discover that in Israel, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. I think we see that going on in our society today. You can track it in American history too. You can track it in this church. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And what did that ultimately lead to? That ultimately led to the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity for the northern ten tribes. It led to bondage and enslavement. It led to the destruction of Jerusalem. It led to the intermarrying and intermingling of the people of God with pagans, producing the Samaritans. People, that's where we're headed. You, if you've got your head in the sand, you don't see it, but if you don't have your head in the sand, that's where America is heading, including the slothful, rebellious, petty, complaining, selfish, carnal church in America. Focused on temporal things instead of focused on divine things. In other words, the conquest of the land illustrates the second half of the doctrine of progressive sanctification in the aspect of spiritual warfare, and that's this generation 
at Bible Presbyterian Church. The battle forces of the spiritual enemy are surrounding us and growing both on the national scene and the international scene. I think I mentioned last week everything from sodomite so-called marriages at home to the insane suicidal terrorism abroad, which is marching swiftly toward our shores. Now, I want to add a couple of things that we didn't cover last week about spiritual warfare. The book of Joshua summarizes the strategies of spiritual war through the physical wars that Israel fought to conquer the land. I've already told you that in real battles, people get killed. That happened in Israel. In spiritual warfares, the enemy are real, the battles are real, the people get killed. And the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The difference is that our enemies are far more powerful than all those ites that the Jews conquered when they conquered the land. And our enemies are invisible. What is the first component of spiritual warfare? Let's talk about that for a second. The first, if you're taking notes, this is new stuff. You've got a piece of paper in your bulletin where you can take notes. The first component in spiritual warfare and the development of spiritual muscles. The 40 years in the wilderness, that is learning to walk by faith, was what has been called a national exercise program. <laughs> the Jews had 40 years of really strenuous exercise. According to Psalm 105.37, listen to this. After that exercise program, listen to this. There was not one feeble person among them. Psalm 105.37, he brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Are you so exercised in your spiritual muscle that you don't have one weak or feeble spiritual muscle in your body? You know, there's also coming a future day for Israel, which is at the second coming, the end of the Great Tribulation, when the very weakest person in Israel will be as strong and as valid as King David in his glory. Listen to Zechariah 12, 8. Zechariah 12 through 14 is describing the second coming of Christ, the defeat of the Antichrist who has just ravished the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of all of Christ's enemies when he touches down on the Mount of Olives and splits the Mount of Olives and comes into Jerusalem and conquers all the hosts of hell that have gathered against Jerusalem. This is in the middle of that. Zechariah 12, 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. God did that for them in the wilderness. God's going to do that for them again when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. This aspect of the spiritual war is expressed by three key words that I told you last week used in the New Testament for progressive sanctification. As you're doing spiritual battle, you press toward these three things. I hope you wrote them down. I'm just going to go through them quickly. Serving, that's the first word, the king of kings with our gifts, talents, testimony, and the watching world. Two, walking by patient, obedient faith, not by sight. Three, growing in holiness and purity so that we'll reflect him. We've got a bloody battlefield. We fight a filthy world. Jesus was in this same world, and he never got sullied by it, and he always overcame it. Every temptation the world, the flesh, and the devil threw at him, he overcame it. But he lived here. He walked among us. He set the example for us how we are also supposed to live, what we're supposed to believe, how we're supposed to respond to the unbelievers. When the, the attackers, the religious attackers like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how do we respond to them? When you've got at the foot of the cross the laughing soldiers, how do you respond to them? When you've got Herod, a person like Herod, how do you respond to him? When you've got a person like Pilate, how do you respond to him? When you've got a person like the woman at the well, how do you respond to her? Or the woman taken in adultery in John 8. How do you respond to her? Do you do it with gentleness? With kindness? Or do you do it with sneering and scorn? With accusation? Jesus lived in a world filled with sinners. Yet he himself was without sin. He was criticized over and over and over again. <laughs> he eats with publicans and sinners. But he never sinned. Do you know how to do it? 
That's our battlefield. And then we closed just reading through Ephesians chapter 6, which is where we begin today. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil's never straightforward. He's a treacherous, deceitful trickster. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You're not wrestling against some kind of Mickey Mouse demon that's on a cartoon. The terms that Paul uses here are for different levels of a military army that is in the middle of a battle. And he's talking about those who lead each of these different levels of the military battle. And that's who you're fighting. But you can't see them. They're in the spirit realm. But they certainly do damage when you don't pay attention to your warfare, when you don't wear the armor of God. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, when the battle is over, you're still standing. You're not lying on the field bleeding or dead. You're standing because you have fought in the power of the Spirit of God and not in the power of the flesh. Because you've worn the armor of God that protected you from the attacks of the evil one. Because you fought the fight with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You used the Bible and not human reason. That's what is expected. That's not for spiritual heroes, not for spiritual giants. That's the spiritually normal Christian life. Are you normal? Are you a dwarf? Some kind of a wheezing little critter crawling around on the ground. This is to be the normal Christian life because you are in a battle. What are you doing to fight for Christ? Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Someday I'm going to preach through this passage and talk about each one of these pieces of armor and why it is so significant. The Lord willing, I hope. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, not just for yourself. Most of us only pray for ourselves. If you divided up your prayer time and counted how many minutes you're praying for yourself versus how many minutes you're specifically praying for other people, not just, Lord bless all the missionaries in the world, hope they're okay. But most of the time we're praying, God, I need more money. God, I need this. I want you to heal me from this. And God, you know, I've got a mortgage payment coming due. And God, i got a dent in my car. And uh, Lord, you know, I think I've got an ingrown toenail. Maybe I'm getting an athlete's foot too. Yeah. That's the kind of stupid prayers we pray, isn't it? We focus on ourselves. What does he say here? Praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, not carnal. And watching thereunto with all perseverance, you hang in there. And supplication for who? For all saints. Now, you're not praying to saints. You're praying for saints. Now, the, the doctrine that says that the only ones who are saints are the ones who are in heaven who got canonized by some organization, that's not biblical saints. Did you know that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, which was filled with all kinds of wickedness and carnality, to the saints which are at Corinth? You go through the whole book and you won't find anybody there who got canonized. Nobody who got exalted, nobody who got beatified, uh, nobody uh, who had done you know, miracles after death and all that kind of stuff. You see, what are we talking about? The doctrine of sanctification as we're going through our studies, the three levels of sanctification. The moment you trusted Christ, you got positional sanctification. You were placed in Christ. You are going through progressive sanctification now. Ultimately, when you die or the rapture occurs, you will have this ultimate perfect sanctification, holiness. You don't have to be 
chosen by some group of men wearing funny hats and red clothes or canonized by some guy with a little white beanie and a white robe. That's not in the Bible. The Bible is the final authority. The Bible is the final authority. If you've trusted Christ, you are a saint. You might be a sinful saint, but you're a saint. But you have to deal with it the way God says to deal with it. We're supposed to be praying, having supplication, that means begging in prayer for all saints. How much time do you spend praying for each individual in this congregation? If you know some of their fights, some of their wars that they're fighting, some of the problems that they're facing, do you pray for those specifically or just sort of run through the list? Lord bless A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, U, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, C, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. And if I missed anybody, them too. How do you pray? You understand that is part of the spiritual warfare? Your prayer life tells how strong your spiritual war is, whether you're doing battle or not. And Paul says, pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Do you pray for me that I will open my mouth boldly? I sure hope you do. You know, there are times when I am tempted to say, well, it doesn't matter. I'll just skip it because all it'll do is make people mad. Pray that I won't skip it if it's important just because it'll make people mad because, you know, I really don't care. I really don't care if it makes somebody mad if it's truth. God called me to preach the truth. And I don't want to stand before Jesus and have him ask me, why did you back down on such and such a Sunday? Because you cared about what people thought. Is that the way you witness? Is that the way you interact with co-workers? We speak the truth in love, but we speak the truth. God's word is truth. Do you know what John 17, 17 says? It's key to what we're studying right now. It says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You want to have sanctification in your life? Where do you got to spend time? Right here. Jesus said that. That wasn't my words. That wasn't somebody asking questions that didn't know what they were talking about. Jesus said, sanctify. That was in his high priestly prayer in John 17, where Jesus is praying for believers, not just the disciples, but for those who will believe through their name. That includes us today. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How much time do you spend in the word of God? That shows how interested you are in sanctification. That shows how interested you are in wanting to be holy. And God commanded, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. How much time do you spend in the Word? How much time do you spend in prayer? Can you think of anything more important than those two things? And the result, which is witnessing, you know, if you spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer, you will be a witness. You can't help but be a witness. You will feel impelled and motivated by the Spirit of God to share Christ with those who are lost. Sanctification is a very important doctrine in Scripture. I hope you're beginning to pick that up. And part of it is spiritual warfare. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. There's the witness part to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. Paul did it even in jail that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now we've asked a question last week. Haven't answered it yet. Just how powerful are our spiritual enemies? You're fighting a battle. Okay, we just looked at that. And we talked about the four different levels of military terminology that's used here in the text. So really, how powerful are they? Let me give you a couple of verses of scripture that will give you just a little hint as to how powerful they are. The first one is in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, if you're taking notes. 
Daniel's been praying. Daniel's been praying. Daniel's been praying. He's been involved in warfare, spiritual warfare, just like we talked about a moment ago. He's been praying that God will help him understand these visions. Very important visions in the book of Daniel because it deals with all of world history. And now an angel shows up. An angel got delayed. How did the angel get delayed? It tells you in verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, that's Michael the archangel, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Twenty-one days, an angelic messenger from God got held up by demonic forces from bringing a message to Daniel. What if Daniel had given up after, say, 18 or 19 days in his prayers? What if instead of continuing to petition God, he said, oh, well, who cares about the future anyway? And those are sort of weird visions. I really don't care what, what they mean. Do you think he'd ever gotten his answer? Do you wrestle in prayer? If the demonic forces, there are demons in charge of each nation of the world, as you look through the book of Daniel, you discover that. And a spiritual invisible warfare is going on right now between the angelic forces and the command of God and the demonic forces, which are fallen angels under the command of Satan. And you see that very clearly in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel and several other places in Scripture. It's raging around you people. Did you know there are demons that have been assigned to you to try to defeat you in your life? And God, in his mercy and grace, according to the book of Hebrews, has ministering spirits who have been assigned to you by him because you're an heir of salvation. And they're having an invisible warfare and a tug of war on your soul as they tempt you, as they try to draw you into sin, as they bring very pleasant things into your life that lead you into paths of wickedness. You don't hear much of that preached except in charismatic churches, <clears throat> but it's in scripture. Most evangelical churches stay away from it because it sounds too weird. And there is a lot of weird stuff out there that's preached that isn't in the Bible. But we have the basic outlines, and part of that is what we just looked at in Daniel 10. A very powerful demon who was the one in charge of the whole nation of Persia tried to stop the messenger of God from coming. And he was stood in for 21 days until Michael the archangel came and broke open the way. Look at chapter 10, verse 21. Now he says, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Ah, so what he's going to say is in harmony with scripture. There's an angel talking. Did you know angels never give information contrary to the Bible? That's a very important test because a lot of people talk about how an angel spoke to them or they woke up one night and there was Jesus in a vision standing at the foot of their bed and he told them something that was contrary to the Bible. But they believed him because they saw it. It was an experience. Do you know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that Satan himself appears as an angel of light? He's not going to show up like a funny-looking guy with a goatee and all red with horns on his head and slanty eyes and a pitchfork in his hand and a big long tail with a point on the end of it. That's not how the devil appears. Satan was originally Lucifer, the light bearer. He's a beautiful angel. He's a musical angel according to the book of Ezekiel. His body, in his body are all kinds of musical instruments built in to produce fantastic music. And Paul says, when he wants to, he can show up that way and he can wow you out of your mind. Satan is an angel of light. And then Paul goes on, he says, no great thing if his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. What they do, does it conform to scripture or is it sinful? By their fruit you shall know them, Jesus said. Anytime you think that you have revelation from God and it is contrary to the word of God, it is from the devil. God's word is truth. God never contradicts himself. God never makes a mistake. God knows what he's talking about. 
He's the sovereign Lord of the universe. So if somebody has an experience and their experience is contrary to the Bible, their experience is wrong. It's either from the flesh or from the devil, with the world giving a little kick in on the side. Don't forget it, people. We live in an age where the evangelical church is going into the charismatic movement like mad. Anyway, moving on. I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. An angel is quoting scripture. There is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. In other words, he's going back and referring once again to Michael the archangel. Chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. Michael is the archangel responsible for Israel. Did you know that? Because Daniel's people are the Jews. And there shall be a time of trouble. Now he's going to talk about the great tribulation we've mentioned in the passing before. Such as never was since there was a nation. What nation are we talking about? The Jewish nation. Even unto that same time, and at that time, thy people, who's that? The Jews, shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. There is a spiritual warfare going on. What Daniel says in Daniel 12.1, we find again over in the book of Revelation, where Michael and his angels fight with the devil and his angels, and they do the final defeat on Satan and his angels. That warfare started all the way back in the Old Testament and it extends all the way through to the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Jude 1.9. Here we find Michael again. And we find him arguing with the devil. But even Michael is very careful because Satan is so powerful. We're talking about how powerful are your enemies. Jude 1.9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil... He disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him, that means he did not dare, to bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Now look, if Michael has to be careful in the way that he deals with the devil, don't you think you'd better be pretty careful too? I think yes. But you know, you have in dwelling in you someone more powerful than Michael. If you are a believer, the Bible teaches that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God is always more powerful than Satan. Always. That's why you can resist temptation. If you walk in the flesh, you're going to fall. But if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do you understand how fierce this battle is that you're involved in? We're talking about the second half of progressive sanctification. Israel is an illustration for us in the visible realm so that we can see how the warfare progresses and what are the principles of warfare. But the battle we fight is a spiritual battle where we cannot see our enemies. But we can learn from scripture by seeing what happened to Israel. Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. You know, Moses didn't die what we call a normal kind of a death. God took him up to the top of the mountain, said, I'll let you see the land, but because you rebelled against me, because you hit the rock the second time instead of speaking to the rock when I told you to, I'm going to kill you here. I'll let you see it first, then I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to bury you. And it says God buried him, and no man knows where his grave is to this day, but the devil knew where it was. And boy, did the devil want the body of Moses. Why? Can you imagine if Satan managed to get the body of Moses and energize it? What he could have done to the children of Israel, making that body walk back down the hill and lead Israel into the worst sins they'd ever committed? They were bad enough already. Revelation 12, 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And we find the dragon is specifically told, we're told that is Satan. 
Those are your enemies, folks. If you're not saved, you will lose. If you are saved and walking in the flesh, you will lose. To win the spiritual warfare, you not only have to be saved, but you must be walking in the Spirit. Controlled by the Spirit of God. Believing the truth. How do you know the truth? Sanctify them through thy truth. That is, set them apart. That's practical sanctification. Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. You need to study your Bible. You need to be engaged in prayer. Not just for yourself with all the petty carnal things that we pray for every day, but for other believers too, because they're your co-soldiers, they're your comrades at arms, they're the ones who are praying for you. There is strength in numbers when we pray one for another, when we pray seriously. Ultimate sanctification. Okay, didn't get as far as I wanted to, but let me give you a final summary. Practical or progressive sanctification is contingent upon the regular daily intake of the Word of God. There is no experience of progressive sanctification without studying the Bible. You will not have progressive sanctification if you don't study the Bible. That aspect of sanctification relates to the experience of the believer in the world. I'm giving you some new things here. Here's four things. You need to write them down. Four steps to progressive practical sanctification are these. The four steps. Number one, the race begins in progressive sanctification at salvation. Right at that moment, you are put into Christ. That's your positional sanctification. But that's also the starting gun for the race of progressive sanctification. It begins at salvation when the believer gets his positional sanctification and starts his new walk as a Christian. That's Ephesians 1. Number two, it should be followed shortly thereafter. Just as soon as you learn it, and you people have heard me preach this before, so you know it. I hope you've done it. It should be followed shortly thereafter when the believer presents his body as a living sacrifice to Christ to be used for God's designed purposes and not for the flesh. You have to present your body. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want God's perfect will for your life? If you've never presented your body as a living sacrifice, you will never know the perfect will of God in your life. Because that is the first thing you have to do to get to that point. That means your body doesn't belong to you. And you are acknowledging it. That it belongs to Jesus and that you only want to use your body for things that please Him. Forget all the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You want your body to please Jesus. Not just your spirit to please Jesus. Not just your soul to please Jesus. You want your body to please Jesus. That's experiential or practical progressive sanctification. But you've got to do that. That's number two in the list. Number three. Progressive sanctification continues and grows as the believer studies the Bible and walks by obedient faith according to the Word of God. Practical sanctification continues and grows as the believer studies the Bible and walks by obedient faith. Oh, remember those two words, obedient faith. Not theoretical faith, obedient faith. Obedient faith according to the word of God. That's John 17 and verse 17. Number four. Practical sanctification is hindered by sin. Practical sanctification is hindered by sin. And it only gets back on track when we confess our sins. And it only gets back on track when we confess our sins. 
you stop dead in your tracks and you can have gone three quarters of the way around and you don't reach the finish line if you stop dead in your tracks, if you sin and you don't confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God doesn't give you more light until you obey the light you've got. When you deliberately rebel against light that you know God wants you to do, you stop on the track. And all the enemy goes running past you. The only way to keep running, the only way to keep growing, is you keep obeying one step after another, one step after another. And if you stumble, you immediately confess it as sin. Don't wait two weeks. Immediately confess it as sin. Because God is both faithful and just to forgive you your sins. Do you know that Jesus loves to forgive your sins? It's no reason to sin because it causes him pain and grief every time you do. And you will have temporal consequences for your sin. And you will have some things that cause pain in your conscience and in your memory, even when it's forgiven. And you may, as Esau did, reach a point of no return where you want to go back and get the blessing and it's lost. You keep your salvation, you keep other rewards that you've earned, but you lose some things that would have counted for eternity. Practical sanctification is hindered by sin and only gets back on track when we confess our sins. Well, we're going to stop there today and you are all invited for the hoagie lunch in the air-conditioned prayer room immediately following the service. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. There's so much in it that applies to the way we live, not just to what we believe in our heads. In fact, your word is designed to, to change us, to conform us to the image of Christ. Father, Take and use your word in the lives of each one of us to first draw us closer to Christ, to give us joy and peace, to cause us to learn to trust you and walk through the wilderness, and then to empower us to do spiritual warfare for the glory of our great King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is the sovereign of the universe, who has called us to be a soldier in his army. Make us faithful even if necessary, unto death. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 623, Jesu Prices Treasure.